steady march to the Rhine is kept up by units of the 1st Canadian Army. Against stiff enemy resistance, spearheads of the attack advance towards the town of Zanten. Zonsbeck, a German anchor defense point lying in the path of the Canadian push, is captured. Its ruins are a grim reminder of the devastating power unleashed upon the Nazis. A brief lull gives a welcome opportunity to put on the feed bag. Even the old dogs get a break. The advance is resumed with armored vehicles taking the lead. The first concern of the Canadians is the elimination of the enemy bulge in the Zanton Basel area near the Rhine. This is the follow-up of the bitter fighting which took place in the Hochwald forest. The muddy terrain does not slow down the advance. Enemy opposition is very heavy, with German rear guards fighting viciously to protect the only escape route in this area. Zanten, the key point of the German escape route west of the Rhine, falls. Swiftly the troops roll through the town towards their next objective. Not a single building in the town remains untouched. The onslaught upon Zanten is a foretaste of the future for Hitler's Herrenfolk. The last great obstacle is reached, the slender winding strip of water that is the Rhine. The army camera sergeant films the waterway from an aero pip. Suddenly, three Messerschmitts pounce upon the helpless Oster. Machine gun bullets find their mark in the back of the cameraman. History is recorded even to his last breath. Somewhere in Germany, the creator of the cartoon This Week's War turns out his little humorous masterpieces. Sergeant Lou Weeks of the Canadian Film and Photo Unit is the artist behind these army portrayals. His drawing board, a former German map case, Sergeant Weeks polishes off one of his cartoons in the short space of 20 minutes. His brainchild has been a regular feature of the army newspaper, Maple Leaf. From the Western Front, his fame is now spread to London's Fleet Street. Arrangements have been made for his cartoons to appear weekly in one of London's largest newspapers, the Sunday Graphic. What old Bill was to the Tommy in the last scrap, so this week's war may be to Johnny Canuck in his march to Berlin. For those members of the CWAC in England who have marital ambitions, a solution has been found for wedding clothes rationing. An anonymous Canadian has forwarded a beautiful wedding dress for their exclusive use. Its arrival is met with delight. The dress is modeled by one of the girls for the edification of her friends. To some unknown donor back home, go the heartiest thanks of Canada's girls in khaki. During lulls in the Italian fighting, Canadians of the 8th Army spend their time making souvenirs. They include many things, even a toy steam engine. Rings are a very popular type of handicraft for the boys to send home. All the articles are made from scraps of metal and leather and wood.
pride is exemplified by the shields bearing the crest of the 8th Army. Much needed tires for military vehicles are being turned off Canadian assembly lines at a rate unheard of a few months ago. The Minister of Munitions, Mr. C.D. Howe, has informed the tire industry that the United Nations supply of tires is critical. To combat this lack of vital military supply, Canadian tire workers have pledged to redouble their efforts. They intend to turn out some 60,000 extra tires within the next three months. Canadian supply is satisfactory and the overflow is being given to other of the United Nations. Thus Canadian workers are keeping in step with the increased tempo of near victory. The first ski race of 1945 is held in the snow-clad mountains of the Laurentians in Quebec. The devotees of skiing gather at Mont Gabriel to test their skill in one of the toughest slalom courses in Canada. The hill on which the slalom competition is held is known as Scott Slip, and it carries out its tradition of knocking the experts for a loop. Altogether, 67 skiers take part in the meet. The final winner is Fernand Lessard of Saint Sauveur. Felicitations! The first Canadian Army boxing finals are held in Nijmegen, Holland. The welterweight bout finds Corporal Samuels matching blows with Sapper O'Brien. The action is fast with O'Brien forcing the pace. The scrappiest fight of the evening finds O'Brien the winner. The middleweight bout brings Sergeant Nyberg and driver Fletcher together. From the opening bell, Nyberg drives in with solid punches. Fletcher goes to the canvas for a brief count, but recovers and comes boring in. Nyberg rushes in for the kill and delivers the final KO in the waning seconds of the first round. A crowd of 2,000 packs the auditorium to see the finals. In a fine display of sportsmanship, Nyberg assists his opponent. In the light heavyweight feature, Sergeant Nikilo is pitted against Lance Corporal Gilderoy. Both fighters have been participants in many boxing tournaments. Nikilo wins this one handily. The boats mark the first of their type held by Canadians in Europe. Tomorrow the boys will be delivering haymakers to Jerry. The security blackout has been lifted on the Army's latest weapon development. It is the rocket projector. Previous to being used for frontline duty, it gets a workout behind the lines. Mounted on a two-wheel trailer, the projector is highly mobile and can be placed in positions impassable under ordinary conditions. The rack contains 32 rockets which can be fired singly or in salvos. Its development has only been reached after long and painstaking research. A variation of the projector is in use mounted on top of a Sherman tank. The firing is done by remote control from the safety of a slit trench. After a successful trial shoot, the rocket projectors are wheeled into forward areas to fulfill their role of medium artillery. Each rocket shell fired is comparable with that of a 100-pound shell fired from a 5.5 gun. Fewer than 200 men are needed to handle a battery of projectors. The equivalent firepower from 5.5s would take the energies of 3,000 men to supply it. This deadly weapon is fast nailing down the lid of the Nazi coffin.